Welcome to the Half Percent Podcast. My name is Nick Plosser. Each episode is an in-depth interview with a member of our military, whether active duty, reserve, or vet. If you or anybody you know would like to be a guest, please reach out and contact me, Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, the Half Percent Podcast. This show is available anywhere you listen to podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Ricochet Podcast Network, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, all of the above. Please subscribe, write us that five-star review, and make us part of your feed. And finally, I want to thank everybody for listening. Really appreciate your time. And with that, let's get into the show. Okay, Mr. Push-Ups, let's hear your story. It's not just the uniform. It's the stories that you tell. So much fun and imagination. From now on, you will speak only when spoken to. And the first and last words out of your filthy sewers will be served. Do you maggots understand that? Welcome back to the Half Percent Podcast. My guest today is Chris. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good, man. Um, so I discovered Chris from his Instagram page. Chris is a a, a pilot, warbird, uh, mechanic, as he just self-described. You're going to go into all that, but why don't you uh, introduce yourself a little bit and then kind of where you're from and how you first got it, how you decided to get into the Air Force. Okay. Hey, yeah, my name is Chris, and um, I live in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and I'm originally from a town called Goldsboro, North Carolina, and, and everybody excuse if you hear noises in the background. As I was telling Nick before we started, my dog, he's very needy right now. He, <laughs> all he wants to do is play and play tug of war. That's so all right. Going, he's welcome. He's welcome. I'm, I'm multitasking, and his name is Boeing, by the way, and we'll get into that later yep. on. Um, I'm from a town called Goldsboro, North Carolina, in Mount Olive, North Carolina. It's actually where Seymour Johnson Air Force Base is. In fact, mm-hmm. my wife and I both are from Goldsboro okay. originally, and you know my folks. I have divorced a divorced family, so I grew up not only in the North Carolina but in uh, the Washington D.C. area too. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and then uh, did, now, do you come? So did you go into the air? Did you go into the Air Force out of high school? Did you did you come from a military family, or what made you decide to go in? I did come from a military family. My dad's an enlisted guy. He's a retired flight engineer, Air Force flight engineer. And he was also in the Marine Corps, too. He actually started off in the Marines. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And then he later on, he switched over to the Air Force. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I, when I graduated from high school, my, my, my goal was always to be, be a pilot. I always wanted to be a pilot. Okay. And when I, went, when I graduated from high school, I went, to, uh, I went to college. And I say, I tell people when I went to college the first time. Because uh, mm-hmm. in this, the, my first deal with college ended up dropping out because I wasn't in my grade, you know, in my books. Yep. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. I was that kid coming from a divorced family, just happy to wait, happy to get away from the uh, the parents and stuff like that. Not doing anything I was supposed to do school wise. You and me both, man. I did the so, same. <laughs> so my dad, I said, Hey, dad, I'm ready to. I'm, I need to go. I'm ready to get out of here. I'm ready to come back home. And on the phone, he said, Son, you can come back, but you have to go see a recruiter. Mm. I said, I told him, I said, okay, cool. So I didn't look back after that, I moved back up to my dad at the time. He was living up in the Washington, D.C. area. So I ended up going to uh, to the recruiter in Northern Virginia. And I uh, went in as a crew chief, as an Air Force crew chief. And it, then the path, the career path was, at least while I was on active duty, get some time, get some rank and stuff like that. Um fixing airplanes and out on the flight line doing that stuff okay and um and then becoming a flight engineer like he did um but you know things didn't always work out quite the right way then either so let me let me let me ask real quick first of all how long i always i want to ask you about how long is your how was your dad in the service total and then oh, did you choose was, did you uh second question is did you did you know you want to go in the air force right away or did you did you just consider the other branches Oh, uh, well, my dad had been in the, his total time. As a matter of fact, he was still in the reserves when I was on active duty. Okay. So he did total time 22, 23 years. Wow. Yeah. And then I, I guess I didn't really, I really didn't have a, have a, a you know, a, I, I didn't have a, a big, 
uh, you know, it wasn't a big deal which branch I was going to. So it just, it just, you know, I was in Air Force ROTC, and I guess you know I was going to go Air Force or whatever. And the whole, you know, again, the whole objective was to fly. Right. I wouldn't have been mad if I was in the Navy flying airplanes off a boat or. You just or wanted. Either. You just wanted to get up in the air. <laughs> That's all I wanted to do. Right. That is okay. It. Okay. So. So, um, so you get, so going into Air Force, what uh, what was your first stop for for basic training? Basic training was San Antonio. Okay. And I'm here to tell you, it's that that right there was a uh, Air Force basic training is a cakewalk too. If if, if people didn't know, <laughs> to me, I mean, I don't know what it is now, but for me, man, it was it was it was it, it was a cakewalk. Okay. Like, yeah, we went to San Antonio, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. Yep. Well, you you mentioned something in your in your pre-show notes that was funny. You said uh, you you went to the drum and drum and bugle corps, bugle corps to get out to get out of work uh, working in the chow hall and can't remember yeah. how, can't remember how to play a trumpet to save your life. So what? Talk man, a little bit about that, man. They made a mistake. They, man, I guess they do this with every every so often, every so often classes that come through BMT. So I'm in there in BMT, man, and and you know. And they come and say, has anybody had any, any experience in playing any instruments whatsoever, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the first mistake they made. I raised my hand. Yeah, I, you know, a couple, few of us raised our hands. And they said, are you interested in doing drum and bugle? If you come do the drum and bugle, you get out of doing uh, doing that KP or that uh, chow hall uh, monitor additional duty type stuff, you know, cleaning right. up the chow hall, serving food and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, let's do it. Could not remember how to play a trumpet to save my life, man. It was crazy. Fake it so till you we, make it, right? Fake it until you make it. There was sometimes the thing was just up to my lips, and I was just pushing on the, uh, on the what you call it, on the top of the trumpet, yeah. and nothing was coming out. <laughs> <laughs> did they figure it out, or did they keep you in there, man? I think the dude, I think I, it, was, it was like they, they really didn't care if you really remembered it that well. And, you know, during band practice would have been the original time when you were supposed to go do, go do uh, your detail, any additional details, clean up the dormitory or whatever, or working in the chow hall, right? And the drum and bugle, it was, it was co-ed. So we had males and females okay. in, in the one flight, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there was a couple of times I got some bad looks. The head T.I., for the, uh, I guess he was the, the the drum major or whatever you want to call it. He would give me a couple of dirty looks every now and then. Never said anything. Nobody said anything. But okay. I was faking it. Because there was a couple of times we were out on parade or doing something like that. And I'm just, and something would come out. It was not on key, on note, or nothing, man. You weren't, you weren't, <laughs> you weren't exactly uh, Dizzy Gillespie on, on that drum. No, it, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. It wasn't Mo Better Blues or anything, man. <laughs> It was it was terrible, but yo, and you know. So so you got through so you got through boot camp and then you had to, then I'm assuming after that you had to go to your is it your specialty school what do they call it where you your job like your job yeah. training thing where did you yeah, go from the Air there? Force they call it they call it tech school or okay. technical technical school Air Force tech school and I was up at Shepherd Air Force Base in Wichita Falls mm -hmm. that's uh, that's what an hour and a half from my house right now hour and twenty oh, okay minutes so yeah it's in uh, extreme North Texas as a matter of fact. The base butts up up against the uh, Oklahoma Texas border. On the Oklahoma River. border there, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. And then, so, how long were you there? How long was that tech school? Let's see. I'm trying to think. Because I know that those the the, is, are the the engineering or technical those are a little bit longer than the normal normal or about what six months that type of thing nine months no, year. It wasn't. It wasn't even that long. It okay. was. I graduated from BMT on Thanksgiving of 1994. Okay. And and I left there so November. Let's just say December, January, February. It was about three and a half, four months. Oh, okay, okay. So then, where do you now? And this is this is before you. This is still just to work on on planes, right? Yes, exactly. So you know, when you're in tech school, they got. You know, I was, I was an F-15 guy, so that's where I was, you know, I was going F-15. So they okay. got old F-15s in there that don't fly anymore and stuff like that. And as a matter of fact, if you go up there and start one, it might it might explode on you know, the <laughs> ramp or something. Something might come hasn't, out of it. Hasn't been maintained in quite a while. Uh, no, no. So so you go there and you learn just the basics. You know, 
first first maybe month of the training or something like that, it's this is a screwdriver. Yeah. This is you know this is how you do safety wire. This right. is a hammer. Right. This you know and don't, there are people there don't people touch a hot wire with your hand. exactly you know this is how fuel system works and right. there's people you know that go through that training that never touched a car and never worked on a car and I, and I dare to say maybe this this the current generation people that might have coming up now you know they don't, nobody takes car in the fixed cars nobody nobody you know, right sucks so but you know we go through there and did that and then the second the next two months you're actually hands on on the airplanes there learning different stuff like how to put air in it and a in a tire or how to change the tire how to take a pump out and stuff like that just basic stuff. all the stuff you'll need okay and then after your uh after that school's over you uh where do you go next i went to uh, during my time when i was going through after i left basic i mean in tech school I went straight to my, my my duty station. That was the Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. Oh. Back back to my hometown in Goldsboro. I mean, they went. They took you right now. Did you know you were going to go back there, or, or was that just a happenstance? That was that was probably a happenstance. But they gave us, you know, they gave us our bases while we're in basic training, right? Okay. And um, well, no, well, I take that back. They gave our bases while we're in tech school, and it just so happened that the squadron, the F fifteen E squadron, I'm, I was affiliated with. They used to be stationed out out in Arizona, out at Luke Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. So, and they were shutting down the F-15s from Luke, period, bringing more F-16s in. So, they took that, those two squadrons and sent them out to Seymour Johnson. There we go. So, right. And then, How'd um, you feel about going back to your hometown, man? I was good. You were good with I mean, that. I was – It the way I had my dream sheet filled out, there was two ways I wanted to go. If I had to fix fighters, if I had to work on fighters, I wanted F-15s, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I had all the F-15 bases. And then if I worked heavies, uh, I wanted to work, uh, at the time, I wanted to work C-5s or C-141s or even KC-10s. So I had all those bases on there. Okay, for right? those of us for those of us in the civilian world, are th those when you call heavies, those are more transport planes? Those, those, those planes? Are, exactly. Okay. And those those take the heavy equipment around for the Air Force and that exactly, type of thing. Okay. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So I'm 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 just a civilian, so you might have to some of the acronyms I will go right over my okay. head. So <laughs> that'll work. That'll yes. work. The big the big cargo and tankers and stuff like that are yep. the heavy. So Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And then I got fighters out of the deal and it was so crazy, man. I get I get Seymour Johnson. Um I got my grandmother lived eleven miles away. Right. And I was there for nine years. And I was, luckily, knock on wood, I was home every holiday. I always saw my family. I could drive. My mom lived in Atlanta. I could drive down there. Right. Six hours. Yep. Four, four or five hours of the D.C. to see my dad, see my cousins and stuff like that. Had my aunts, uncles and stuff right there, right there at me. So. Oh, that's cool. It was cool. like I never went. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That, that's, that, yeah, you got some... Uh... Now, were, is it was it were you living on base or was it kind of like a nine to five gig where you could kind of live on the in, on a civilian and then go into work or how did that work? It both ways. When you've before maybe the first two three years, I lived on base in the dormitory, mm -hmm. and then I finally moved out. And when I moved out, I lived with my grandmother for three years. Saved some money too, right? Save some money or spend some money. You know. <laughs> right, at that age, when you're younger, right? At that age, yeah, you don't know anything about lease. You know, most of us don't know anything about saving money or investing in stuff like that's that. That's right, that's right. And then um, maybe a year and two at Seymour, I met my, met my now wife. And, heck, we've been together for 20-some-odd years anyway. But um, then eventually we got married, and then we moved in together. And then I ended up living back on base again. Mm-hmm. And until I PCS, so. Okay, so, and then now you were, at, you said you were at uh, nine years, and then uh, your last four years was at Shepard Air Force Base? Back at Shepard. I had, I had gone to Shepard one year, and in the Air Force, they, on the enlisted side, they have skill levels as far as your, that, that, coin, that coincide with your, uh, your rank, and all that so mm -hmm. there's there's like when you go to tech school when you get out of basic training you go to tech school you're one level when you graduate from tech school you're three level and then once you 
you complete some correspondence courses and stuff like that, and you get promoted like the staff sergeant, which is uh, E5, mm -hmm. you become a five level. Okay. And then, well, I'm going to take that back. You become a five level before you get before you get staff sergeant e, E5. Then once you make E5, you can become a seven level. Mm hmm and you stay seven level until you become an E8, which is a nine level. So it's one, three, five, seven, and nine. Those are the those are the levels. Okay. And um, I had gone to Shepherd for a seven level, what they call a seven level course. So a seven level school. Okay. And I was in there and I saw some old friends that were at Seymour with me, with, with me that became instructors there and all that stuff. And we were, you know, I said, I'm never going back. I'm never, I'm not, I'm not I cannot come back. It's Shepherd, Shepherd's out in the middle of nowhere. nowhere man. Right. I mean, there's nothing going on. And I'm like, I'm never coming back to here, blah, 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 blah. And I'm here to tell you, a year later, <laughs> I got orders. <laughs> in fact, I got orders to go to Wichita Falls to be an instructor. Um, Right after the, our jets came back from Desert Storm Two. Okay, right. And so, uh, well, you know what? You had you got not you got nine years of pretty good duty. You got to live basically back home. So the last four were payback for for, for your for your, pin, here, for your penance, right? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> when I was at Seymour, I had an, an assignment to Lake and Heath, England. Oh, okay. That's, and I'm and I'm not a shoulda coulda woulda person. And right. I'm not. I'm a guy who, who who goes by. I don't live with any regrets. Right. However, comma, that is one of the things I do regret because I want, you know, I, I should have taken out a sign at the Lake and Heath, but, you know, I turned it down. Uh, it's like I was in love, blah, blah, blah. I didn't want to leave my damn girlfriend. Right, da, 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 right. Making that mistake. I mean, I mean, 20 some odd years later, we're still together. So I guess I guess it was for a reason it all worked out. But that's just one of the places I would have I would have liked to gone. I was just uh, yeah, I was just about to ask, did you get a chance to did you get a chance to go? Did you leave the states at all during your service, or did you? I did. Where, Saudi would deploy it over to Saudi Arabia. Okay, and then what? And were you you were repairing? That was during uh, that was during uh, second Gulf War. That was actually in between the Gulf Wars. So we were doing Operation uh, Southern Watch. Okay. Out of uh, Al Qahard, Saudi Arabia, at uh, Prince Sultan Air Base or PSAF. and I went with a uh, I went with another squadron. That was there because at Seymour, there's four F-15 squadrons, Strike Eagle squadrons. Okay. Two of them are combat squadrons, and the other two are training. So the entire time I was there, I was I was stuck within a with an FTE or fighter training unit. Mm -hmm. So guys, they get done with UPT and they get F-15Es, they would come to my squadron, and learn how to fly that jet. Okay. Same stuff, but you know, but you can do it deployable. So I became deployable, and I went I went to the desert with those guys. So and that, that was. Uh, well, is that patrol in the no-fly zone during that time? Is that what their exactly. that mission was? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. We had the southern half. We yeah. had the southern half. So. Basra and all that. Okay. Okay. Cool. And then, um, so how long were you in the desert for? Three months. Three months. What were your uh, What were your impressions? Other than probably uh, being hot as hell. Hot. But you know what? It, yeah, it got up to about 130 degrees Ooh. out there. But uh, but you know what? It was more brutal in North Carolina when it was 90, 95 degrees with 100% humidity yeah, I'll versus take the, 130 yes, dry. I, I, lived over, <laughs> I lived over in Southeast Asia and spent a lot of time in East Texas during the summer, and I'll take the dry heat over humidity exactly. any day. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, we were restricted to base. We couldn't go anywhere because that was not too long after. I don't know if you remember Cobar Tower. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so everybody um, was on high alert a bit for U.S. Yeah, personnel. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it was – you worked uh, – uh, what did we work? It was either six on, one off, or it was seven on, one off, something like that. But, you know, on your day off, all you could do is wash clothes and relax. And other than that, you were – Kind of like I wish you were, wish you were still back at work because you were busy doing stuff. Yeah, you yeah, doesn't give you much time to 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 for R and R at all, really. No, no. I mean, I made the best of it. It was you know, it was it was an experience, and and um, there was a uh, a couple times I was at Seymour. I tried to go back, but you know, there was always they would always rotate guys in and out and say, "No, you've been. Somebody else wants to go from the squads, and so you get to stay home." So other so. than was that your only uh, international deployment? It was, believe it or not. In the 13 years on active duty, that was the only one. That was the one. Okay, and then um, so you get kind of, and I always ask this, is, was there some, did you meet some people that 
in your time in the service that kind of uh, stuck out to you in terms of maybe mentorship or leadership or what were oh, your absolutely. impressions of people like that? Some names that stick absolutely. out for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I'm still friends with these, with these, these, the main two guys today. Um, you know, I got on active duty, you know, cause I've been around airplanes my whole life. Yep. Right. So growing up, I got all these books on F-15. So I, you know, and there was a couple of times I got in trouble in class and tech school with the instructors because I was that kid that, that thought they knew everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 So, you know, I had a, like, for example, I had a, uh, during the first month of tech school, going through that fundamentals class, something I was, I was pissing off my, my instructor. She was civilian instructor, but I was making her mad. And what happened? We were getting ready to take, go over the engine lesson about jet engines, basic jet engines Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And before I went to tech school, I was reading up on all this. And my dad had his all his all his airframe and power plant books and stuff, right? Civilian books. Yeah. I was reading up all that stuff big time. And I did something, man, and I made her upset. And she gave me the block test. Because at the end of each course, you get what's called a block test. You know, they're in there. Everything's divided up in blocks. Right. She gave me the block test for engines. And she said, you better, you better ace it. It's like a hundred questions, right? You, so you better make a hundred. So you know it all. So you better do a hundred percent, right? Oh man, I took that test. I missed one question. Oh, okay. She was hot. <laughs> <laughs> she was hot, and man, I got through with that, and then blah blah blah. Then my 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 uh, my uh, enlisted instructor when we got to that fifteen side, he had to pull me out of class and and talk to me. But anyway. Yeah. Again, that you know, you think you know everything, you straighten your stuff, you're happy, you're proud. Dude, I'm at home, I'm at Seymour Johnson, I'm with family, I'm, I get to work the, the, the my, my favorite airplane, my favorite machine, I'm going to go out here, you know, and, and show off for these people, right? Yeah. Um, like the first, within the first couple of days of working on the flight line, I got my first uh, LOA, letter, and LOA in this case was a letter of admonishment. Okay. On a flight line, we have what on an Air Force flight line we have these. Uh, they're usually E6s and above. These guys are called we call expediters, and what they do is they push the maintenance, push to work, push what needs to be fixed and what needs to be done on a flight line, right? Mm-hmm. So I get out there, man, and the guy, you know, I'm a new guy, so I get I get a credit job, right? He says, I want you to go over there. Go to the airplane over in the hangar over there, blah, blah, blah. And, and these were his words. I want you to rip out that kick step on the jet. I said, okay. And the kick step on the F-15, a lot of fighters have it where when you climb up the side of the jet, if, if you don't have the regular boarding ladder that, that you can hang up there, yep. there's a ladder installed in the side of the airplane. And you, ro- you lower that down. And then inside, the, on the frame of it, you can you take your foot and kick in if you're not kick in this door where you can it's like a foothold. Right? Oh right, like a little foothold, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And it's hinged and all this stuff and and the way you're supposed to pull it out is you gotta take the back seat of the jet out and you gotta wedge yourself in the underneath the left uh uh footwell where the rudder left rudder pedal is in the back seat. Mm-hmm. And if you too, if you're too big of a person, it ain't gonna work. You can't get in there. Can't get in there. You're going in there head first. Can't see what you're doing. And the box that the, that that makes up the assembly for the kick step has these bolts on it. And all these bolts have this sealant around it. This mm-hmm. air sealant. Mm-hmm. You got it. And it's and it's a good I don't know about twelve bolts. And you can't see it. You can't see the sealant. Can't I can't I could not do it. You know. And I was like. What the heck on? So I went and took a screwdriver, jammed it in the side of the jet, and broke the hinges and ripped the kickstep out. <laughs> the dude told me to rip out the kickstep, and I did exactly what did he exactly said. Exactly just that. And he lit into my behind, Jack. And the bosses and stuff, they had a chuckle over it, but they 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 ripped me a new one too, and I got my LOA and I was, you know. And it was like maybe for a year or close to a year. That, you know, he was always jumping in my case for something, whether or not if I did something right or wrong, you know. Yeah. And then so finally I said to myself, you know what, I just need to shut up and listen to what this guy has to say. Yep. 
and this is this is the growing up process and me starting to you know swallow pride and and just just man up and just you know what we all have to do to become men man exactly That's right. and this and this guy I credit him with saving my life. Hmm. Actually, I mean, I, that's what I tell him. You know, I mean, I didn't do anything that, 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 that I would, you know, die. But he just, you he was know, pivotal. He was pivotal. He was pivotal, and he kind of made me to where I am today a little bit. You know, because um, he, he was, he was a crew chief. He was a hard nosed crew chief, hard to get along with. But he, all he wanted to do, he told me, he says, all I want you to do is impress me. That's it. Mm-hmm. Your airplane, that's your airplane, blah, blah, blah. When you're on your airplane, you know, you're you're in control of it. It's yours. It's your jet. If you ain't out there pissing off the other people like that that, that are coming out there to work on your jet, then you're not doing it right. Mm-hmm. So you need to impress me. And I, and, I, and I listened to that. Yeah, I started pissing off other people. But, you know, it, it became to the point under his tutelage and another, another buddy of mine um, that I would always make mad and stuff like that when I was coming up. But. You know, they took me under their wing, and um, I learned a lot from them. Learned learned a lot about life. Right. You know, because on the Air Force flight line, you know, I'm the only black guy out there right. a lot of times. Right. And you know, these guys, we, you know, it was it was it was a family out there. Mm-hmm. But those two guys right there, I mean, today, if they say, Chris, you need to go to war, and you're going to go to war with these two guys right here, will you go? I say absolutely. Yeah, that kind of that kind of old school tough love and and uh, telling you the truth especially when you don't want to hear it and uh, absolutely you know th- those absolutely. those are the kind of guys at the time you know I was being a hard-headed jackass myself at a young age I had a few of yeah. those in my life too and I still same like you I'm to this day I still am keeping contact with them because I think we young men especially they need those we need those in our lives man exactly exactly and and then it got to the point you know where where when I'm working out on the line, doing the stuff, fixing jets like that, I could do stuff my way, mm-hmm. and they would they would you know approve. And it wasn't even about approval. It was just like you know he's out there doing the stuff. I'm not gonna bother him. You know I mm-hmm. wasn't that guy that had to go in there and clean up the hangar or go or 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 shave the ur- urinals and stuff like that for additional <laughs> details and stuff like right. that. No, right. I was outside fixing airplanes, fixing well, jets. You know. Once you you learned their trust, and once you earned their trust, then that was okay. Yeah, you could have some leeway. Yeah, like all of life, pretty much. That's cool. But so definitely. those those two guys stick out for you and and uh and so did you uh after your as you're, as you're kind of winding down what did your you know what you you mentioned a little bit of uh you know morale was a bit low and you said you, you your your words where you kind of fell out of love with it what what kind of talk yeah. about that your process of kind of saying hey it's time for me to go um yeah even before i left to go to shepherd it seemed like there was a generation of air force leadership not only on the on the high end and with generals and stuff like that, but also within the organization itself, you know, my squadron and all that stuff, where it was just, it just wasn't fun anymore. Mm-hmm. That that one guy I told you about that that was a mentor, he eventually retired. Mm-hmm. The other guy, he eventually, as he was progressing through rank, he PCS to another squadron, moved, you know, down to another squadron yeah. down the road. So other people were coming in, taking their place or different. And it just, it just wasn't. And then, I mean, we had our group, you, you know, your friends and the guys you work with out on the ramp. But all of us, it seemed like we were just getting pummeled and beaten down no matter what. Right. You know, for example, they, um, we used to have the big, a big morale point that we used to have. At one point in our squadrons, we had a bar. We had a squadron bar. Mm-hmm. Now, in a fighter world, and maybe maybe the big airplane world too, all the operations on operations are the pilots and stuff. Okay, there's always a bar in operations. Okay, the pilots always did. You know, I envy, always envy those guys that just the camaraderie they had amongst one another. Their tradition, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it seems like you know. They 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 work hard, fly hard, and they also play even harder. Right. Maintainers, we're the same way. We work hard and play harder. We do that too. But you know, we had our little bar. We had our own little thing, man. That especially during the spring and the summer when it was warm, Fridays we would have uh, burger burns, and then we would have uh, cookouts, man. One guy 
would leave the flight line, get all these steaks and stuff. Oh, you know, nice, we had, nice, we, nice. I mean, we just, we just cook out, have a good time. Yeah. You know, the day shift guys would do all the cooking, the swing shift guys, and the, the evening guys would fix all the stuff on the flight line. The boss would say, hey, we're cutting it off at 9, 10 o'clock at night so we can come and partake. And a lot of times at 9, 10 o'clock at night, the party's still going on in our bar. You know, yeah. nobody's not getting out of line. Nobody's driving home drunk. None of that stuff. But you guys but just it. have your own thing, and it's a it's a camaraderie thing, and it's a blowing yeah. off steam thing. You guys take care of each exactly. other. Exactly. Yeah. We had a good time, and then it got shut down. Oh, okay. We had new leadership come in, and they shut it down. And that was when that happened, man. That was, and then my buddy retired. That was that. This it just seemed like everything just went. Right. Started taking a nose dive, and so, it wasn't fun anymore. Right. And it started not to be fun. So, and then I PCS to Shepherd to Wichita Falls to be an instructor, a tech school instructor. And at the time of that PCS, I was putting in orders to go back to Lake and Heath, putting in orders to go down to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, to Vegas, to Aviano, Italy, anywhere I can go to get out of Seymour, at least for just a couple of years, do something different. I was putting in those orders. And then every time, a, a couple of weeks later, I always get a, a reply back saying no your your request has been denied because seymour johnson and your organization is undermanned mm-hmm. undermanned under kept getting the undermanned response back right mm-hmm. then all of a sudden i got orders to shepherd air force base and especially and when you go to tech school being an instructor you it's a special duty so you have a minimum time of which you need to be there mm-hmm. and there was i know there was like one or two other people in my squadron that were applying to go to tech school to be an instructor and they get they're getting turned down to be an instructor and i'm getting picked to go to, i didn't want to go you, right. <laughs> you i didn't want to go you got to you got I, to leave you got to leave north carolina but not to the, not to the place you want really wanted not to where i want not to where i wanted to go so you know and you get there and you know i was in air combat command when i was on the flight line and you're doing 200% all day, every day. I mean, you just go, 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 go. No time to chill or relax, you know, because it's all about generating airplanes, getting sorties up, getting, you know, yep. you know, we, we got to do our mission as far as the fighter world is concerned, right? Yep. And when you get to Shepard, everything comes to a complete stop. Okay. Because you're dealing with students now. You're in, you're in training command now. Yep. You're dealing with the students. You're teaching. You're taking your time to do stuff. You can't, you know. You know, when you first get there, the first couple of weeks you're there, when stuff needs to get done, you're jumping up trying to get it done. When really you're supposed to be just throttling back, taking your time getting it done and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Right. And just, you know, but as stuff progressed when I was at Shepherd, I mean, there was nothing to do there besides uh, go to school, get your degrees and stuff like that. And um, and maybe drive down to Dallas, and that's about it. That's about it, right? It was boring, and then and I think I put on my on my uh, on my questionnaire about the politics and stuff like that. Yeah, like the politics within the Air Education Training Command was something else as far as at the organizational level. You yeah. Know? Oh, you did. Yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah, you said yeah. dealing dealing with that with the intricacies of that kind of ground you down as well. Yeah, because there was there was a. Uh, I, you know, in the, in the Air Force, we have a enlisted performance report or EPR evaluation system that every enlisted person must have every year. Mm-hmm. And and it's just feedback, and it goes in your record, man, and that controls promotions and stuff and blah, right, blah, blah, yada, right. yada, yada. And I had no problem with promoting, but it, it got to, there was, I had, I had started getting a condition and a medical condition where I couldn't participate. I couldn't do PT real hard. You know, mm-hmm. I just couldn't do it because, and then the, when I started getting evaluated by the medical folks about it, they saw that I was unfit for worldwide duty. Okay. I'm like, wait a minute, guys, I've been dealing with this medical stuff for the past at that time, the past eight years. And I've already deployed, I went to the desert. I do all this stuff. I'm in combat squad. I, you know, I do all this stuff from flight line, but I don't want to get to Shepard Air Force Base. I can't, I can't go anywhere because I had an orders. I had orders to uh, Osan, Korea. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was getting ready to get out of there, man. I was pretty pumped about yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And they canceled the orders. And when they canceled the orders, you know, my, 
my boss told me to write my EPR and all that stuff. I was going through this stuff and I, and I and 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 I had got downgraded on my EPR because of the because at the time before I got diagnosed with what was going on, I got downgraded on the EPR, which hurt my heart. Yeah. And that and whatever they downgrade, that also skews you from certain medals and stuff like that that you can receive, right? Gotcha. Points for promotion. Yep. And I had a I even had a group commander to go to our what our, our command uh a command chief master sergeant to try to coax her to change or allow me to get a medal or change my EPR. She wouldn't do it. Mm. She said no, wouldn't do it. And all my medical records say say X Y Z, right? Mm-hmm. So so when that stuff was going on, I said, All right, I'm done, I want out, blah, blah, blah. And I was getting ready to get my bachelor's degree. The airlines were hiring and stuff like that. Yep. And I had and it was and it was it was pretty it was a t- it was probably the toughest decision I've ever had to make in my life up to that point. And looking back on it, even to today, right now, the second, it was the toughest decision I had to make to get out to leave the military behind. Yeah, it's such a large part of who you know who you were at that time, or you know exactly. all, all your whole life up to that, especially exactly. given, given what your father did and and all that yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's as long as you did everything you're supposed to do. Guaranteed paycheck, roof over your head, yep. you know, closing your back, you know, it was, it was stability, right? And you've got a certain, like you said, a certain sense of camaraderie with people. You got guys right. you'll, you know, you guys you can rock with and be around and, and that type of thing too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Right. And, um, my wife had a hard time with it cause she's a military brat. Oh, so, right. So she was used to that as well. Yeah. Her dad, her dad did 23 years too. Okay. Yeah, he did 23 years. <laughs> And um, so she was having a hard time with that. And I decided, you know, I had many conversations with my dad. I said, Dad, what should I do? And my dad, I love my dad to death. He is, he is, he is very objective. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? He will not, he would not try to put his own personal feelings upon you. He lets you make your own decision. Just gives and I you, love him for that. Gives you the gives you the truth and then lets you make it make it for yourself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I said and I said, Dad, listen, man, I know your objective, or whatever, but I want what what do I do? I want a hear a definite answer from you. And my dad said, he said, Chase your dreams. Mm-hmm. And I said, Okay, that's all I wanted that's all I wanted to hear. And I got out, man. I I, I did some I pulled the trigger and then I and I left, man. I just it just wasn't getting for me anymore, man. It's just a, when they canceled that assignment to Osan, that meant the next seven years of being on active duty, I would have been a Shepherd Air Force Base teaching. Steve, oh, seven yeah, years, yeah. You know, yeah, and I no. did not want to do it. I wanted to go back out to the flight line. I wanted to, I wanted to, I, and I was going to F-16s or something like that. And right. I wanted to get back there and, and handle the business of, 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 you know. Doing what you got in to do. Exactly. But. And I think, and I think it was all with the grace of God, and I, and and it was just, it was just, it was just wasn't meant to be, yep. and everything just lined up, and you know, and which brought me to where I'm at now. Okay, so you now you now up to this point now, because you're a pilot, so up to this point, what uh, have you been training the whole time? Have you been getting your flight hours while you were in the Air Force because you were I a mechanic? Was. But have you did you do that in the civilian world or what? I did, I did. The whole time I was on that, well, not the entire time. Maybe when I was in. Started out as an E4. I was learning how to fly airplanes and stuff like that. And by the time I got ready to get out, I already had maybe close to 1,300 hours of flight time underneath my belt. And what is it? How many hours you need for commercial flight? Is it's it's? I don't remember. But nowadays, now it's 1,500. You okay. 1,500 hours. Okay. And and um, <clears throat> then it, back then it, it that wasn't that wasn't the case, but. Um, I had before I even got my orders, saying, "Yep, your 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 separation orders." I had already interviewed with three airlines. Okay, so you were ready. You were already planning. You were already well into planning the next step. I was well yeah. into planning, and before I even the weekend before or the week before I even got my graduation from my bachelor's degree, I had with my first interview. So, and but the whole time I was a shipping out that. Shepard, like I said, it was boring. Mm-hmm. 
but it was my most productive. Okay. Yeah, because you don't have anything else to do, so you might as well, you might as well make use of your time, right? Exactly. And do, so do some self improvement. <laughs> exactly. So I finished my bachelor's degree, and then for the last year I was a shepherd. My boss and my commander let me do a part time job flying uh, what they call pipeline patrol. Okay. So I would hop in a Cessna 172. Yep. And fly from Wichita Falls all the way down to Houston and back once a week. At like uh, a couple hundred feet off the ground, inspecting oil pipelines, looking for leaks and all that other stuff. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was a big time builder there. That was about 600 hours worth of time. I was going to say, that was a great great way to also get out get out of the base a little bit, but also get your, ti- your hours in. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I did that, went to school. So I was being very productive. And then, you know, and the, the regional, see, and I started out with the regional airline. So they were hiring big time. Yep. And, you know, the average person they were hiring had about five or 600 hours underneath their belt. Oh, you were. Maybe less than that. You were almost triple that. And um, being that I was in the military already and, you know, and blah, 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 they were just waiting on me to separate. Yeah, I was going to say, you probably had your pick. You pick in that case. <laughs> they were just waiting on me to separate. And yeah. I said, well, cool. So, yeah. So you've been, and then you've been a pilot ever since. So talk to, now this is kind of takes us to where, how I found Chris on, uh, I found him through his Instagram page. He has a cool, really cool Instagram page that I'll have you plug in a second. But talk to me about Victory Flight Training, man. Okay, Victory Flight Training. Or, or Victory Aviation or Victory Flight Training. They're, they're, we're headquartered out of Denton, Texas. And uh, what we do is we operate three, but one is being rebuilt right now, three Marchetti S211. Um, they are actually jet warbirds. At one point, they were combat airplanes. The two airplanes we had, they were combat airplanes and trainers for the Singapore Air Force. Oh, okay. And um, what we do is we offer advanced uh, jet training um, that incorporates what we call UPRT. It's called Upset Prevention Recovery Training, mm-hmm. which is a big deal now in the in the airlines and in the in the, in the corporate uh, aviation industry and stuff like that. And what we do with that is we we have these scenarios. You know, what happens if you're flying around or you're taking off behind a bigger airplane at generating all this wake and all that stuff and all of a sudden you end up upside down oh know? so it's extreme it's like extreme extreme situation dealing with extreme, extreme situations in the exactly. air exactly right exactly i mean you're, are you going to panic or are you going to freak out and lose it and next thing you know you're smoking hole in the ground that's right or are you going to take a quick deep breath swallow you know all the fear and all that stuff and you're going to correct what's going on you know stuff like that so so go for sorry go for it so we do that uprt you can also, we also train you how to get what's called a type rating in airplane so you can get completely checked out in the jet. Um, formation flights, uh, we do for pilots that just never flown a jet like that before. So, to, you know, go out and do aerobatics, pull Gs and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's a good time. So how long have you, and, and how long have you been involved with that? Is that you, did you start that company or did you get involved with that company? I got involved with them. I do have, I do own a company, but it, it's, it's just me, my, me as the entity, you okay. know, contract, and I'm a contractor. So these guys, there's an airplane out there called an L, L, L39 Albatross. Okay. And it's a very popular airplane in the United States, very popular airplane on the world. You, you Google L39 Albatross and you'll see that there are a lot of them. And there's probably 600 civilian owned of these airplanes in the United States. Okay. And these are jet warbirds too. They built Czechoslovakia, and the majority of them come from the Russian Air Force. Okay. And I'm um, a buddy of mine. That's a United pilot had one, and I went up one year up to Connecticut, and he threw me in the front seat. We went flying, had a blast, right? So I'm sold. I want this L39. I want to do this. Blah 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 blah. So fast forward to just a year ago, I'm making contact with these guys at Victory Aviation through IG and all that stuff, right? Yep. And, and another pilot, a captain I flew with, his son did a little part-time internship or whatever you want to call it with Victory 2. So, you know, he was telling me about it and this, that, and other. And so I go over, I, well, I go over, talk to the guys about it and stuff like that. And the guys that own Victory Aviation, the owner, he's a ex-Marine Corps pilot. So he flew F-18s. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he flew Helos to C-130s, and then the chief pilot, or his number two there, he's an ex-Marine Corps Hornet driver. Oh, okay. Okay. And um, 
they were like, yeah, why don't you come on and check us out, you know, blah, blah, come get checked out in the airplane. I'm like, man, I would love to do it, but I know how expensive it is, right? Yeah. And, and, and they said, well, if you're already a CFI, why don't you just come and you get checked out in the airplane and we'll pay you to come out and be an instructor for us. And you can just teach people in the airplane, get all your flight time, just teaching and blah, blah, blah. Nice. So I'll, so it didn't it didn't take me but two seconds to think about it. Right? Yeah, right, exactly. I said, well, let me let my let me let me you know let's talk to the wife. Right. So we go out and do an observation. I'm not an observation flight, but a uh, a familiar familiar familiarization ride. And I'm in the back seat. I'm out having a blast. You know, I'm already sold on it. Before I even get in the airplane, I'm already sold on it. So yep. my wife came out and I told her what the spill was, and she gave me the head nod. She gave me the okay, and I was shocked. This was August of last year, and I thought it was going to snow hmm. because she gave me the okay. So I said, <laughs> I said, I said, I said, all right. And then so I went and got the type rating in the airplane, and I've been um, instructing with them or for them ever since. So, so you kind of good time. you kind of uh, switch your time between uh, the airlines and that, or well, are you well, full time? Full time airlines, but just it's it's like you know it's like think of it almost as a hobby. It's just yeah. something I I do on the side, just check that square, just to go out and have fun. Absolutely. You know, sometimes sometimes I go hop in a jet by myself, like I'm probably going to do here in the next couple of days. Nice. And just go out and do some loops or something like that, get, just to get that out of your get shake the trees. Shake the trees. Yep. That's yep. cool, yep. man. Cool. So, well, Chris, how, tell us tell us how now you're uh, on Instagram. It's a uh, dope seven six driver. Is that right? Yep. That's Dope your 767 driver. Yep. Yep. So go, uh, everybody go. Uh, Chris has got a really cool Instagram page. Always some, some, some great, some great views. Uh, you had a, you had a cool post on a, a overhead picture of DFW that you yeah, just put yep. up there. And then some great flight pictures as well. I always enjoyed looking at some, in some cockpit, uh, you know, footage and, and things like that. So I always enjoy looking at your page. How else, uh, how else can they get you? And then talk about your, uh, your, your, is it the Visla? Visla. Yeah. Visla. Yeah. So you, yeah, he has Boeing, his own page, yeah. right? Yeah, Boeing, B-O-E-I-N-G, because, you know, when I got him, I was flying Boeings. Yep. I've only flown Boeings. Now I'm getting ready to go to the Airbus. Airbus. But I'm not going to change his name to Airbus. He's going to stay Boeing. <laughs> I really don't want to go to the Airbus, but whatever. <laughs> yes, Boeing, duh, D-A, Vizsla, V-I-Z-S-L-A. All right, he's got his own, and he's got his own uh I'm looking right now, man. Uh, he's got 537 followers, man. <laughs> so, so he's pretty popular. He's a good. He's a better looking dog than I am a man. So I, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's a good dude. He's <laughs> laying on the couch, looking at me, saying, "Dad, would you please pay me some mind before I fall asleep?" <laughs> and uh, and it, the uh, the Marchetti is it Mar is it Marchetti? Is that how you pronounce it? Close, almost Marchetti. 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 Sorry, it's a hard C. Well, that uh, so and that training school uh, I can get at www.s-211training.com. Is that right? That's it. That's it. The only catch with that when you get in that airplane and actually go fly it, because the FAA still freaks out about an aerop- this airplane because somewhere in the world it is still a combat jet. As a matter of fact, in oh, the Philippines right. it is. Okay. So you have to be a pilot just to even, just to, well. You don't have to be a pilot to ride in the back, but but in order for them to make money off of it and, you, and they charge you, you have to be a pilot to get the training. Okay, so. okay, all right. Well, cool, man. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time, man. I really yeah, appreciate. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you sharing your story, and and um and I'll continue to be uh continue to be enjoying your your IG page, man. And um yeah, and, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks uh, for the time, man. All right, all right, Chris. We'll talk to you down the line, man. All right, have a good one. You too.